Hello Year 10, welcome to your first podcast on a poem and this podcast is on the poem Remains by Simon Armitage. The podcast will take you through step-by-step revising for this poem. It would be helpful if you had a copy of the poetry work pack for summer too because there are sections you can fill in and most of the information is in that pack as well but there are some extra bits and pieces on this video and you can watch the video and just make notes on line paper if you don't have a copy of the booklet. If you want to get a copy of the poetry work pack, you can pick it up from school, a hard copy, or um, there's a copy of it on the website. So let's start off with step one. As you know, any new poem that you come to revise, the first thing that you need to do is read about the context and the writer's message and learn of that information. So I'm going to talk you through the context of the poem remains now. Now it's up to you what you want to do as you watch this. You might just want to watch it and take it all in, or you might want to make notes. But some of the information will be in the pack that you've got anyway. So you might at least for the first time just want to watch and listen and take that information in before you start making notes. So to start off with, in 2007, Channel 4 made a documentary about ex-soldiers called The Not Dead. It's a fantastic documentary. If you watch it now, it still, it still grips you. It's really, really interesting. Basically, it told the story of three soldiers who'd returned from war alive. So they didn't die in battle. They came home after a war. And it talked about the effects that the war had had on them. And each of these different soldiers, each of the three, had served in a different conflict. Simon Armitage got involved in the making of this documentary, which is where this poems come from. So when the documentary was being made, he listened to the ex-soldiers stories and for each soldier, he wrote two poems and these poems got read aloud on the documentary. So basically, he learned all about these soldiers and wrote poems based on their experiences. And then what happened was he put all of the poems together into one anthology that he called The Not Dead. And you can still buy that anthology now in certain places. So all of these poems um, went into one anthology and that anthology was called the same thing as the documentary The Not Dead. OK, so we've just learned that Simon Armitage, after getting involved in this documentary, wrote poems about these soldiers. In fact, he wrote eight poems and then he put them in an anthology called The Not Dead. And this um, anthology was basically sort of the poems that accompanied that documentary. Now, the poem I'm going to read to you now isn't the poem for your GCSE, so don't worry about that. It's not one of the poems you'll be studying. It's not Remains. Remains is the one that you do. But this is the title poem of the anthology. So if you were to get that book, the anthology, and read it, this would be the first poem that you read. So it's quite important that you have a look at it because it sort of summarises his overall view. So I'm going to read the poem to you now. All you need to do is listen and think and think about the poem. So it's called The Not Dead. We are the not dead. In battle, life would not say goodbye to us and crack shot snipers seem to turn a blind eye to us. And even though guns and grenades let fly at us, we somehow survived. We are the not dead. When we were young and fully alive for her, we worshipped Britannia. We, the undersigned, put our names on the line for her. From the day we were born, we were loaded and primed for her. Prepared as we were, though, to lie down and die for her, we somehow survived. So why did she cheat on us? Didn't we come running when she most needed us? When tub-thumping preachers and bullet brain leaders gave solemn oaths and stirring speeches, then fisted the air and pointed eastwards, didn't we turn our back on our nearest and dearest? From runways and slipways, Britannia cheered us. But returning home, refused to meet us. Sent out a crowd of backbiting jeerers and mealy-mouthed sneerers. Two-timing, two-faced, Britannia deceived us. We are morbidly ill, soldiers with nothing but time to kill. We idle now in everyday clothes and ordinary towns, blowing up and breaking down. If we die for cover or wake in a heap, Britannia from horseback now crosses the street or looks right through us. We seem changed and ghostly to those who knew us. The country which flew the red, white and blue for us now shows her true colours. We are the not dead, neither happy and proud with a barcode of medals across the heart, nor laid in a box and draped in a flag. We wonder this no man's land instead. Creatures of a different stripe, the awkward, unwanted, unlovable type, haunted with fears and guilt, wounded in spirit and mind. So what shall we do with the not dead and all of his kind? OK, so if you were to buy that anthology, that would be the first poem that you read. So that is sort of the poem that introduces all of the others. You've got to think to yourself, 
well, what, what's Armitage saying about war? And I think what Armitage is trying to say is, we're very happy to send soldiers away to fight for us. We're very happy for them to go and protect us and protect our country, even at quite a young age. But what do we do for them when they come back? They're coming back and they're suffering. Does our country turn our back on them then? Are we doing enough to protect people who we rely on? Or when they come back, are we just leaving them to suffer? And that's what the whole anthology is about. So when you come to look at the poem Remains, you've got to remember that that's Armitage's opinion, that basically we don't do enough to protect them when they come back. We allow people to go and fight for us, but then we don't support them when they come back and they're suffering from the effects of having fought in a conflict. OK, now here's a bit of specific context on the actual poem Remains. The poem Remains is about a soldier called Guardsman Tromans. Guardsman will be his army title and Tromans is his surname. When Armitage wrote the poem, he wrote it from the perspective of Guardsman Tromans. So it's as if Guardsman Tromans is the speaker of this poem. It's written through his eyes, through his point of view. There's a picture of him there. You get to see him in the documentary and he tells his story. Guardsman Tromans was stationed in Basra, Iraq. And the poem tells the story of him spotting somebody looting, so stealing from a bank in Basra. So he's in Basra keeping the peace and he sees somebody stealing from a bank um, because it's obviously an area of conflict where people could get away with things like that. Guardsman Tromans couldn't tell if the looter was armed, but if somebody's armed, if somebody's got a gun, he's allowed to shoot at him. But if he's not, he shouldn't. But he assumed that he probably was, that this looter probably had a gun. And so Tromans and two other soldiers started shooting at him and eventually they killed him. Tromans saw the man lying on the floor in agony. He said he, he could just see this man was lying on, in agony on the floor. And his inside, he'd been shot so much, his insides were literally on the floor next to him. And Tromans saw someone pick up his insides, put them back into his body and then just throw the whole body into the back of the lorry. The rest of the poem is all about Tromans not being able to forget the memory and, and the negative effect that that has on him. So even in the following weeks, when Tromans on patrol walking around, he can see the blood and it reminds him of the memory. And even when he goes home on leave, he can't forget the memory. Whatever he does, he just can't forget this memory. It's affected him so badly. It's changed him. It's changed who he is. So it's about the negative effects of war on, on this soldier. So next, we've got to think about what Armitage was trying to say. What was his message? And the message that we've come up with, the teachers have come up with, was this. Simon Armitage perhaps wrote this poem in order to explore the lasting psychological damage caused by conflict. Because in this poem, we can see a soldier and how it doesn't stop at war. He goes home and it has a negative impact on his mental state. You know, he's got his psychological damage has been done. And that's what this poem shows us. So you might want to make a note of that message. OK, so as you know, step two has got several parts to it. but I'm going to do them a bit at a time. So first of all, um, when you're at home revising, you'll read the poem twice. For the purpose of this today, I'll just read it once as clearly as I can. But obviously, if you were doing it at home, you'd want to read it a couple of times to really get that poem into your head. And you would be looking up any words that you don't understand um, and, and making sure that you, you know what they mean. You look them up. So let me read the poem to you. On another occasion, we got sent out to tackle looters raiding a bank and one of them legs it up the road, probably armed, possibly not. Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else are all of the same mind. So all three of us open fire, three of a kind all let him fly. And I swear, I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. So we've hit this looter a dozen times and he's there on the ground, sort of inside out. Pain itself, the image of agony. One of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body and he's carted off in the back of a lorry. End of story, except not really. His blood shadow stays on the street and out on patrol, I walk right over it week after week. Then I'm home on leave, but I blink and he bursts again through the doors of the bank, sleep, and he's probably armed, possibly not dream and he's torn apart by a dozen rounds and the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. He's here in my head when I close my eyes, dug in behind enemy lines, not left for dead in some distant sun stunned sand smothered land or six feet under in desert sand, but near to the knuckle, here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. 
Okay, so the next part of step two is this. You will have one of these in your pack, a glossary of structural features. So it's all the structural features that come up in quite a lot of these poems. It's a really useful tool. Now, what I want you to do now is have a look at this glossary of structural features and look at the poem remains and try to find which structural features this poem uses. And if you can, as a challenge, think about why has Simon Armitage chosen to use those structural features? Could they symbolise anything? OK, so have some time to do that first before looking at the next slide, which has got some of the answers on it. OK, so look at the structural features, try to work out which ones you can find in the poem. You only need a couple and think about why they might have been chosen. OK, I'm going to talk through some of the structural features in Remains and you might want to make a note of this. You might have found some different structural features and they could be right as well. But here are some key ones that you might want to take note of. First of all, Remains has got a volta. That means when a poem's got a turning point, so suddenly the tone, the mood shifts in the poem. So in the first half of this poem, the speaker seems very nonchalant. He's almost not bothered. So he uses phrases like, tosses his guts back into his body, carted off in the back of a lorry. He sounds very nonchalant about what he's done. However, when it gets to the line, end of story, except not really. After that, we see his true emotions and we see how haunted he is and by how damaged he is by what he's been through. Now, Armitage could have done that to show us the long lasting effects of conflict that doesn't stop on the battlefield. Conflict carries on in a soldier's mind when he goes home. OK, you don't need to write all of that down, just some key parts of it. Another structural feature is enjambment. We know what enjambment is, when a line runs onto the next line and it doesn't break where it should. And that enjambment could symbolise in this poem the fact that the speaker's lost control of his emotions. Because when enjambment's used, the poem can start to sound out of control, just like the speaker's emotions are out of control. And lastly, it's written in quatrains. That means that each stanza, each verse of the poem, is four lines, like quite regimented, army-like. But if you look at the very end, it breaks down and there's only two lines. And that could symbolise how the speaker, guardsman, trovans, breaks down later on. Now, you only really need to learn one of those. So pick your favourite if you like and learn that in detail and what it symbolises. OK, we're moving on to step three now. And step three is read the additional information on the poem and answer the questions. So if you were studying this poem without this video, you'd be, there'd be a page in your booklet with additional information on it. You'd read all of that and then you'd answer the questions on it. But obviously, for the purpose of this video, I'll go through the additional information with you. The additional information could be anything. It could be a bit of extra context. It could be something about the poem, what it's about, or it could be some language features that would be helpful for you to know. And in this case, it is language features. So first of all, this poem contains colloquial language. Colloquial language is just a formal way of saying chatty language. It basically means the sort of language we use when we're communicating casually. Think about this the way you talk to your friends. So an example of colloquial language might be, let him have it. That's very colloquial, it's very chatty. So this poem contains that sort of language, colloquial language, chatty language. Something else that this poem uses is what we call an anecdotal style. OK, so I'll just explain what that means. An anecdote is a short story based on a real life person or event. And it's usually funny. If you tell an anecdote, it's funny. So if something's written in an anecdotal style, it's usually written like a light hearted story. So here's an example of an anecdote. Could be. I once had a golden retriever. She was so clever. Every morning I'd open up the front door and she'd run out, pick up the newspaper and deliver it to my husband at the breakfast table. I mean, it's not that funny, but it's a light hearted sort of story. And if you look closely, Remains uses an anecdotal style. It uses a sort of light-hearted, chatty style. You've got to think to yourself, why has Armitage done that when he's talking about something so serious? Something else that's used in this poem is illusion. Now, you'll definitely have heard of this when we studied A Christmas Carol, but let's just refresh everybody's memory on it. In a piece of writing, allusion is when the writer mentions something, usually from history or from the Bible or from literature that people will have heard of. But the idea of it is that because people have heard of it, it helps the writer to get their point across. So again, I'll give you an example to make that clearer. There was once a boy called Sam who was quite a Romeo. 
Now, we know Romeo comes from the play, Romeo and Juliet. We know that Romeo is somebody who falls in love a lot. So it tells us that this boy, Sam, must have been quite romantic. We know this because lots of people know about the character Romeo from Romeo and Juliet because it's famous. And that's what illusion is. When the writer mentions something either from history, sometimes from the Bible, or sometimes from another piece of famous literature that people have heard of to help get their point across. So start to think about um, any illusion that you can find in Remains. And I'll give you a clue, it's near to the end. Okay, so when you've read the additional information on the poem, you can have a go at answering the questions. Now this podcast is first going to be used in a school session. So if you've got time, you might be given time to answer these questions now. However, if you're looking at this podcast from the school website, obviously you can have a go at answering them at home. If you didn't get to have a go at them in school, maybe go home and have a go at them later on. Okay, so use the additional information we've just talked about to have a go at answering those questions. Okay, step four is to have a go at completing the theme sheet for this poem. So with the list of themes that appears, I'll just show you now on the theme sheet, the list of themes that appears on the left hand side, you've got to try and think how each of those themes links to the poem remains. OK, um, now you might have a copy of this table in your pack, in which case just fill it in. If not, you might want to jot down the themes and write next to it how you think each of them could link. If there's a particular theme that doesn't link, then just put a cross next to that one if it doesn't link at all. But really try to link every theme to the poem if you can. You can see here, I've put a few examples up, which you've seen before. So, for example, the theme of power links because the soldier is powerless to his own emotions. And it's OK to say if something's powerful or if it's powerless. Both of those work with the theme of power. OK, so have a little go at completing your theme sheet now and find as many links between these themes and the poem as you can. OK, step five is to learn the top quote and the analysis and to test yourself. In your booklet, the top quote will be in a table. So with a table with three columns that says the quote and then has the analysis and then which themes it links to. But I'm going to go through the three top quotes now bit by bit so that you can listen to them and then you can test yourself on them. OK, so the first top quote is this bit. End of story, except not really. His blood shadow stays on the street. Okay, first of all, this is a Volta. This is what we were talking about before. It's the turning point of the poem. At this point, the speaker stops being nonchalant and he reveals his true emotions and the fact that he's been damaged by war. So if you were talking about this quote, you talk about it being a Volta. It's a turning point in the poem where the speaker stops being nonchalant, he stops being casual and he reveals his true emotions and just how damaged he is. The word shadow might have been used by Armitage to symbolise that just like a shadow, the memory of killing that man now follows him around. It's haunting him like a shadow follows you around everywhere. That memory follows him around. But it could also symbolise that the memories now become part of him. It's part of who he is because a shadow is part of who you are. It's part of your identity. So just like a shadow, that memory is following him around and it's become a part of him. So really powerful words you could talk about. And you wouldn't need to put the noun shadow you could just say the word shadow and as long as you are talking about it in an analytical way and explaining why that word's been used, you'll get just as many marks. Don't feel like you need to name what language feature every single thing is. AQA, they're not interested in that. They're interested in your analysis of it. And lastly, the verb stays reminds the reader that this memory is permanently there. It's inescapable because the word stays has got connotations of something that's not going anywhere, that's permanent. He cannot escape that memory. It's permanently with him now. And you might have also noticed in this quote, although I've not written it on, that you've got shadow stays street. You've also got sibilance, which creates a really sinister tone, which highlights the sinister memories that he's got and the, the sinister situation he's in, that he's trapped in that horrific memory because of what he's experienced at war. That's quote one. OK, now quote two. Quote two is, and the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. So if you remember, this is from the part of the poem when Guardsman Trowman is on leave and he's trying to forget what he's seeing and he's drinking, he's taking drugs and nothing will get rid of it. So the quote is, and the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. So let's have a look at some of the language features within this quote. First of all, it's a metaphor because it makes it sound like 
that man is inside of him. It makes him sound like the memory's part of him. It's living inside of him and he can't get rid of it. Now, obviously, that man isn't inside of him, so it's metaphorical. It's a metaphor that the memories become a part of him. And then you've got alliteration of the D, the drink and the drugs. Now, the repetition of the letter D creates quite a forceful tone, drink and the drugs, a forceful tone. And that might have been used to symbolise how desperate he is to get rid of the memory. It's like he's trying to force it out. Then you've got flush and it's a dynamic verb. That's a verb with a lot of action, a lot of power to it. Now, you wouldn't have to put that. You could just talk about the word flush, but it is a dynamic verb in case you wanted to know. Now, the word flush has got connotations of waste and it makes you think of something your body's trying to get rid of, something your body's rejecting. So you could say that Armitage used it to show that it's almost as if the, the soldier's body is trying to reject the memory. It doesn't want it. It's damaging him inside, so he's trying to force it out. Even his body is having a physical reaction to this memory and trying to reject it because it's such a damaging memory. And lastly, you've got this repetition of and the, and the. And that makes the sentence sound longer and the drink and the drugs because you could just put and the drink and drugs, but and the drink and the drugs. It makes it longer. And by elongating that sentence, it emphasises how difficult it is to get rid of the memory, how long it's taking, that he's getting nowhere. It makes it sound difficult and it emphasises how difficult it is to get rid of that memory. OK, and the third quote, the third quote is near to the knuckle. Here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. Now, that's the last two lines of the poem. So he's describing um, how he can't get rid of, of the soldier and that war might seem, just before this, he said, war might seem glamorous, but actually it's near to the knuckle. It's here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. So let's have a look at what language features we've got in this one. First of all, near to the knuckle is actually an idiom. And when you say that something, oh, that's a bit near to the knuckle. When you say that, it means that something is distasteful and crude. So, for example, if you made a joke about something to do with um, something sensitive like um, race or disability or anything like that, people would say that's near to the knuckle. It's distasteful. It's crude. And so it suggests by calling the memory near to the knuckle, it suggests that war's not glamorous. War is distasteful. War is crude. It's very anti-war. OK, you've also got the phrase bloody life in my bloody hands and um, bloody hands alludes to Shakespeare's Macbeth, where at the end of Macbeth, Lady Macbeth is trying to wash the blood off her hands. But there is no blood on her hands anymore. It's the guilt she's trying to wash away because they've killed the king. So in this poem, Armitage might have used that allusion to Macbeth to symbolise that the soldier can't wash away the guilt. Just like Lady Macbeth, the soldier can't wash away the guilt of what he's done. He's unable to wash it away. And then the repetition of the word bloody just further emphasises that guilt because he's reminding himself of the blood that he shed. So the repetition of bloody emphasises his guilt even further. OK, so when you've spent some time learning those top quotes and learning the analysis, which you won't be able to do instantly, you can spend time at home revising with flashcards, getting people to test you or just writing it out over and over again. Get this table and see how much you can remember without looking at the quotes. OK, don't forget, there's a copy of the quotes and analysis in your workbook that you'll be able to use either online or um the actual pack that you've picked up, then you practice writing out those quotes. You might even want to draw a few of these tables yourself and just keep practicing until you've learnt uh, the quotes and the analysis for this poem. OK, so when you've completed all of those steps and spent a bit of time revising each section, take the mini quiz on the poem and this will be in your booklet. OK, so here's a copy of the mini quiz. You may have time to do this today or you may want to do this at home. Um, and you won't know the answers until the feedback booklet comes out and then you can mark your own quiz and see what score you got and see which areas you need to further improve on. OK, so this is the mini quiz for remains and that will be the same with every single poem. OK, thanks for listening.